Good evening. So, uh, my name is Dr. Vino. I am the first year DMP resident from Rajini Hospital, Clinical Medicine. It's my esteemed honor to present a very interesting case that is updated under us with Pyrexia oh, Bandon Allergen. Now, the patient that we are talking about is a 52 year old male, hailing from Kumarapuram, Ernakulam, who was a driver by profession. When he came to us, he had a past history of TB lymphadenitis diagnosed. He had completed treatment and was declared to be cured in 2017. And he also had a history of being under treatment for uh, zero negative cholelo-arthropathy, for which he had taken proposition in 2021 from an outside hospital. He was also treated recently for COVID-19 infection. When he came to us, he had come with a background history of anesthesia of pain. Also, when he came to us, he had an intermittent fever history of two to three weeks, along with anorexia and pain loss. So, on the primary physical examination, he was found to be febrile, while the systemic examination was found to be with normal levels. Now, that here the question arises, what are the primary differential diagnoses? So, at this point, if anyone in the audience has any uh, differential diagnosis that you can think of, you can shout it out. So at this point, our differential diagnosis is where, because of the background of tuberculosis, it is a reactive, it could be a reactive issue of tuberculosis. And since he was immunosuppressed after the docosigena, we considered the possibility of an opportunistic infection and also a flare of the previous seronegative arthritis, also a bacterial sepsis. So in the view of so we need to come to get enough time and we need to get him together and get a lot of financial constraints. And uh, the at least the first three visits he was not being correct. By the time he came to us, he was, he was quite sick, he was toxic, he was dehydrated, blood pressure was on the lower side. So our primary suspicion was was he going to find sepsis? And uh, at that point he knew that he was immune suppressed. He has been on tofacitinib before and the previous time he was on immunomodulating drugs. He developed tuberculosis. He was evaluated at, at our hospital. It was a game expert proved tuberculosis for which he is completed six months of treatment. And uh, as his condition was deteriorating, he admitted him immediately. And he had to start to want high kidney repair. That was one of the first steps he done after drawing uh, pandemic cultures. So, as Sir already mentioned, after the initial assessment as well as culture, blood culture and urine culture present, we started the patient doing a marrow by giving 2 gram IV stat followed by 1 gram as external infusion. Now, following this, we did a detailed primary analysis of the blood, in which blood protein showed a significant rise in the total count of 16,600, but the platelets are within normal limits and uh, it was a primarily neutrophilic uh, leukocytosis along with uh, mild monocytosis. The ESR was grossly elevated at 165. Well, so we noticed that the alkaline phosphatase was pretty high at 359 and uh, troponin was positive at 1.61 and CRP was grossly elevated at 281. The initial blood culture reports came back to be negative after 5 days of uh, waiting uh, and uh, the urine culture as well and urine routine were also sterile and uh, the thyroid function test was normal within normal limits and peripheral smear showed a neutrophilic leukocytosis with shift in left and monocytosis. So the chest X ray, initial chest X ray that we had taken showed bra uh, slight bronchovascular mark, increased bronchovascular marking, but nothing to point to a consolidation that would explain the CRP rate. And we had done a USD abdomen which showed multiple tiny variable sized lesions in both lobes of the liver. And an echocardiogram was primarily taken which showed the EF at 40 to 45 and a global LV hypogenesis. So at this point uh, we knew that the patient had developed some form of myocarditis. And uh, what was puzzling was the lesions that were present in the liver. We had no idea what that was at that point. So uh, we got an immediate CT scan done, uh, a CT chest and abdomen. Even before the report came out, we had called it interventional radiology. We had planned a biopsy for the liver lesions, suspecting it could be a probably disseminated tuberculosis. There was no evidence of bleeding or bleeding on the chest X-ray. Also, we had a slight suspicion. Was there an autoimmune overlap? 
this zero negative alternate was never classified in those specific time. So we were really not sure about the autoimmune issue there was. But since you are not responding to methods of thing easily, so I don't know how to get started in one of the first so yeah, as I already said, the differential diagnosis at this point was again tuberculosis, any opportunity to disseminate infections and a flare of seronegative arthritis. At this point, we did a CT abdomen and chest. The CT scan showed right-sided fluid location with ground glass in, as well as a pseudoaneurysm at the level of abdominal aorta at the level of division of uh, right renal artery. When we initially saw the aneurysm, uh, first thought was maybe dealing with some form of vasculitis. So uh, again, we uh, went back to the radiologist and to our immunologist. So generally, in vasculitis or in uh, probably secondary to the zero negative arthritis, like in aneurysm spondylosis, the pattern of aneurysm is quite different. It's usually the IOT group that's involved with the aortic regurgitation. We also have suspicion of possible infected hydrocarditis, thinking it could be a possible mycotic aneurysm. There were no signs of infected endocarditis. There were no signs of infected endocarditis. The transthoracic the transthoracic echo was normal. Yeah, there was no peripheral signs. Yeah, the myocarditis we did not uh, suspect any form of infective endocarditis secondary to the myocarditis. Right. It's a when it is a predominantly myocardial dysfunction, infective endocarditis producing a myocardial dysfunction per se is extremely unlikely. Yes, sir. But at the same time, this patient presented with features of sepsis and there is an aneurysm. So, infective aneurysm is, I think, is the it's most possible. important possibility and this is likely to be a sepsis related myocardial depression which produces the troponin elevation also. That is also possible. And uh, see, uh, this other connective tissue disorders, usually the pericardium will also be involved. Here there is no pericardial involvement, rather pure myocardial involvement. Yes, sir. So moving on to a disease specific investigation, initially we had run uh, tropical infection panels along with syphilis and galactomannan which were all which all came back to be negative at that point along with uh, vasculitic workup which was also negative. The only significant finding that we could find was an elevated ferritin level at 1486. So, and we did a transesophageal echo in the view of uh, suspected infective endocarditis and it was found to, there was found to have no uh, vegetations or plaques in the transesophageal echo. So, at this point we were at a dilemma and because of the pseudoaneurysm and uh, instead of putting the patient through multiple other investigations, we went for a FTG PET. So, in the PET... Did you have a question, sir? Did you have a question, sir? No, no, no. Okay. okay. Okay, sir. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. So okay. that is the one we can uh, we can uh, that can tell us where exactly is the focus. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So an FTG PET was taken, which showed diffusely FTG avid pseudoaneurysms in multiple places in the uh, right uh, lateral wall of abdominal aorta and in the left common carotid, left internal carotid, and left popliteal artery with uptake of FDG and it was uh, suspicious of a mycotic aneurysm along with uh, there were also FTG avid enlarged abdominal para aortic lymph nodes and also the chest showed ground glassing with right sided pleural effusion which is opined to be either infective or inflammatory. So these were one of some of the images you can see the right sided uh, sorry left sided uh, carotid artery aneurysm and that was the uh, right uh, para aortic lymph node that had taken up that is the liver taking up FTG. So, uh, post the PET scan. We did consider a possibility of uh, a disseminated tuberculosis for the simple reason that he's had TB in the past. There were necrotic lymph nodes. Uh, the only thing is the vascular aneurysms were quite, uh, quite difficult to explain. Uh, we also considered a possibility of mucoidosis. Uh, histoplasmosis is probably a little uh, uh, far thought. Differential. Miliodosis usually should produce a huge spleen, isn't it? Yes, sir. there was no spleen there in Galley no whatsoever. Spleen. There yes. was no spleen. There Disseminated no tuberculosis seems to, because it can affect the vasculature also. You're it right. It can sir. affect the myocardium. There are reports of myocardial tuberculosis. Yes, sir. <laughs> he was not a diabetic. So at this point, we held a multidisciplinary meeting which composed of internal medicine, critical care, immunology, as well as infectious diseases and we decided to start the patient on empirical ATT 
moving on uh, in the meanwhile we had already done a bone marrow as well as liver biopsy the reports of which came right after we had done the pet both of which showed so bone marrow aspirate as well as bone marrow biopsy showed myeloid hyperplasia with mild plasma cytosis and the gene expert from bone marrow was negative and the liver biopsy also showed multiple separative inflammation with no granuloma parasites or fungal elements and the fungal culture gram staining culture and sensitivity asb and gene expert were all negative from the liver as well as bone marrow now at this point we had essentially ruled out disseminated tuberculosis but still the mdr tuberculosis was a possibility and since it's he had a history we didn't want to completely rule out tuberculosis the next possibility was a disseminated fungal infection meliodosis was still on the run so uh, by this time patient had completed around 2 <coughs> weeks of att and despite being on 2 weeks of att showed absolutely no signs of improvement the crp levels were consistently <coughs> high and the fever spike showed uh, no uh, difference at all okay So at this point, because of uh, all the possibilities, we held a second multidisciplinary meeting, and the patient was started on voriconazole because of the possibility of disseminated fungal infection. And we kept at the back of the mind to start ceftacidem if, in spite of voriconazole, to the fevers persisted. Now at this point, about uh, three to four days after starting voriconazole, one day in the morning rounds, uh, we noticed that the patient complained of. a uh, pain behind the knee and on further examination we noticed that there's a swelling behind his left knee and his patella was pulsatile so because of the previous uh, pet showing a popliteal artery aneurysm we were obviously scared that the aneurysm size might have increased and it is a impending ruptured uh, rupture of popliteal artery and uh, on further examination we found the peripheral pulses were weak and we did a usg arterial doppler of that leg and we found that the in fact the popliteal artery had aneurysm had enlarged in size to a size of 7 into 5 cm you can see that in the peripheral angiogram as well and we had a uh, immediate emergency ctvs consultation and he went uh, underwent a left popliteal artery aneurysm resection and reconstruction so initially we had considered the possibility of taking a biopsy from one of the aneurysm but the bleeding out was one of the risks that we had faced so ctvs had told that if at any point of time we had to do a reconstruction of the aneurysm we will be able to get a histopathology so we did and we sent the hist vessel histopathology and the vessel histopathology in the microscopy showed dense inflammatory infiltrate composed of predominantly neutrophils along with lymphocytes and eosinophils uh, which was suggestive of uh, acute and chronic inflammation meanwhile all the special stains were non contributory and uh, impression was that it is a collection of necrotic debris and again uh, tissue mtb and ntm qualitative pcr was negative and fungal culture as well as culture and sensitivity were negative so at this point we went back to the textbook and uh, when everything fails instead of doing higher fung test we are supposed to re reassess the patient go through the history go through the physical examination repeat the possible initial examinations again so we did so uh, at this point we had almost hit rock bottom we had no idea what was going on the patient was constantly deteriorating we did give them the option of a second opinion from another hospital and uh, from our side we also asked uh, um, other doctors who we trusted uh, their opinion as well we contacted dr ibrahim itchen from <coughs> moc we contacted the cmc team for pulmonology we contacted dr anu varier in aster but uh, even after all the discussions we realized that all of us had the same thought process and uh, the next plan that we had was probably start the patient empirically on amphotericin considering a distant possibility of histoplasmosis and that was a huge step to take so we went back to assessing the patient again he had constantly been telling us that there was no history of travel no history of rash nothing that could pinpoint to any possible diagnosis in the history so after sitting with them again and counseling them and reassessing history the patient said uh, 10 days prior to the onset of fever he and his family had traveled travel to idiki and then they had come back from there 
but uh, there was nothing special in that particular trip other than the fact that they went there stayed overnight and came back so uh, because of the travel history which is completely new to us we send an iagm script typhus on 23rd of uh, february and on 28th iagm script came back to be positive and he was re recuperating from his surgery the popliteal artery aneurysm surgery at that point and uh, on the same day we started the patient on doxycycline and uh, about 36 hours after we started the patient on doxycycline he had his last spike fever spike uh, and uh, the next, the very next day, about 48 hours after starting the doxycycline, we checked the CRP again, and for the first time in one and a half months, the CRP fell from 283 to 42. And uh, yeah, so the patient, we continued the patient on doxycycline, tab doxycycline for two more weeks. The patient is still under our follow up, patient is completely febrile since, and he did require a common carotid artery aneurysm repair later on, which went uneventful. So that was the common carotid artery aneurysm that had to be repaired. There was a small thrombus in that, but patient is completely fine. Um, thanks, Dr. Veena, for the fine presentation. Um, the tragedy of this case is um, generally when a patient with pyrexia of unknown origin or a tropical illness comes to our unit, we generally start the patient on ceftriaxone and doxycycline empirically. And then as the reports come, we de-escalate. Uh, here, what's happened is uh, we were prejudiced from the beginning that the patient was immunosuppressed, he had a past history of tuberculosis, and he was acutely getting worse. We didn't consider the possibility of uh, an epidemiological correlation where uh, it could be something like scrub typhus presenting as an uncommon presentation. So I think this would be the take home message that all of us have uh, to consider the uh, uncommon manifestations of a common disease uh, rather than a common manifestation of an uncommon disease. Thank you. Uh, so there are uh, case reports of scrub typhus co causing uh, vascular uh, an abnormalities including aneurysms. So uh, during my time in Bangalore, uh, we used to get a lot of scrub typhus cases there. It's similar to how uh, often we see leptospirosis here. Scrub typhus has a lot of uh, predisposition for the vascula vasculature. We used to get a lot of pulmonary embolism cases, a lot of uh, vascular gangrenes, even strokes. Uh, but we've never <laughs> seen an aneurysm before. We went back to literature. There are isolated cases where they have medium vessel uh, vasculitis and aneurysms. This would probably be the first case in literature where there is a large vessel aneurysm. It probably could have been worsened since he was immunocompromised. So uh, uh, this is the team that worked with us. Dr. Jacob, uh, the head of ICU. Dr. Dantis was an immunologist. Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Jolsna from pulmonology. Dr. Neto was no longer uh, working in our hospital, but uh, despite working in Gotem, he was present in all the virtual meetings during the multidisciplinary uh, team. Uh, Dr. Renji is our senior consultant and my boss. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't come today. Uh, he was the lead on this case. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Sunny and API for giving us this opportunity to present this case, and Dr. Korith RHOD, who has been uh, supportive uh, for this from the very beginning. Thank you. I request Dr. Madhukumar to come forward and give a moment to Dr. Meena. I request Dr. Itachan to come forward to give a moment to Dr. Vinod. Uh, 